and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. I'm glad you could join us for today's installment. We're going to be digging into the third chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. So it's the book of Romans, the third chapter. And I'm just grateful that you can join us today as we seek to grasp hold of God's word, to grasp scripture, and to begin to not just study it or read it, but apply it to our lives. Because what Paul is saying to the church at Rome is also what God is saying to us right now, wherever you are. So I thank you for joining us. And I hope you find this to be a beneficial journey through God's word as we travel through together. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You have blessed us. You have loved us. You have given us your grace, your forgiveness. You have declared us righteous when when we had no claim to righteousness. You have set us free from our sin when we were slaves to it. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this awesome gift. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we turn our attention to this third chapter of Romans, uh, we need to remember a little bit about the situation. You've got a divided church. You've got a power struggle going on between Christians of a Jewish background, who some of which may have come to faith in Christ at Pentecost there in Jerusalem. And then you have the Gentile believers there in Rome who basically kept the church going when the Roman emperor had expelled the Jews out of the city of Rome. And that included the Christian Jews. There wasn't a distinction there. So you have that dynamic. They've all come back into the church. There's conflict going on. And that conflict is seeming to center around those things that divided the congregation. It wasn't just that power struggle between are the Gentiles in charge or are the Jews in charge. Because it was Jewish tradition and the old Jewish belief that was a little distorted, that was being used as that distinction between the two groups. And Paul is setting the record straight theologically on what is really going on and how God relates to both groups, Jew and Gentile, because he relates to humanity in one way. Now, He does draw on some distinctions between the two groups, but then he makes it very evident that they're on a level playing field, even though there are some distinctions and maybe one group has had a benefit, but that didn't help them any. So that's the background for what we're looking at in the third chapter. And this is the beginning of a discussion really that's going to play out through the bulk of the letter to the church at Rome. Most of the chapters we're going to study are this back and forth between the law and grace. And what are the benefits of each? What are the pitfalls of each? You know, how, what are some of the accusations against those that stand on grace and things of that nature? And we'll get into that discussion as Paul gets into that discussion. He's continuing on with some more diatribe here, some more um, drawing on his 20 plus years of, of preaching at this point to say, hey, here's some of the common questions or some of the common uh, rebuttals to this comment I'm making, and let me address them. So let's dig in to the text now, shall we? Let's turn our attention to this third chapter here in Romans. In the first verse, it says, then what's the advantage of being a Jew? And you may go, wait, Scott, that just kind of comes out of nowhere. What's Paul referring to? Well, remember, he's referring back to the end of chapter 2, where he says, you are not a true Jew just because you were born to Jewish parents or because you've gone through a ceremony of circumcision. But no, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart 
seeks praise from God and not from people. So there's the criteria. He's saying to be a real Jew is a change of heart before God. It's not a ceremony or a ritual. It's not some activity you participate in. It is a change of heart wrought by God's spirit at work in your life. So then we get to chapter three. Then what advantage or what's the advantage of being a Jew? And he just says it. He says, is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Well, yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. So he's drawing back to history. And when he uh, talks about the value of the ceremony of circumcision, what he's talking about is this thing that makes you distinctively Jewish. Okay. It's an identifier. It's not necessarily the ceremony itself he's talking about, but he's talking about it as a, a peg on which to hang the hat of this is what it is to be a Jew. Okay. So here we go. He says, yes, there's great benefits. First of all, now I have to stop there and go, first of all, what's he mean by that? Sounds like he's going to give us a list. Ah, but he doesn't give us a list. This is a first of all on a list of one. Yeah. And that's probably an interpretation problem on our part. What he means there probably isn't first of all, as in the first thing on the list is, but instead first as in, as in preeminent, as in the most important thing, the, the, the one distinction that outweighs anything else you could come up with is this. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. The Gentiles didn't have that. The Gentiles didn't have the truth of the Old Testament. They didn't have God revealing himself, God putting forth his standard of righteousness in a clear codified sort of way. The Jews had that. The Jews had that knowledge and that relationship as a covenant people with the one true God. They knew the truth. The rest of the world didn't. That's a huge difference. And so Paul says, First of all, the Jews, they were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. He goes on. True, some of them were unfaithful. But just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? There we go. Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. Now, that was actually David in Psalms expressing after uh, living under the, the punishment of his adultery with Bathsheba, acknowledging, hey, I've suffered for my sin. I've been punished. I've seen consequences for my sin. But you know, God is still just. God is still righteous. If we were in a court of law, God would be proved to be right here. And so we see that quote here. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, look, the faithfulness of God is dependent on the faithfulness of God, not on the faithfulness of his followers. Now, is that an excuse for us to not be faithful? No, we're called to be faithful. We're called to be obedient to God, to follow him with our lives. But you don't have to do anything more than pick up a, a magazine, a newspaper. What's a newspaper, right? Um, hit a website, hear a news report to hear of some, say, Christian leader, some well-known pastor or something that has had a moral failing or has decided that they don't believe in God anymore and they're walking away from that life or whatever the case may be. Or maybe it's someone you know personally that, that you understood them to be a believer and to be following God with their lives and they do something hurtful. They do something that betrays that trust. And you, you may want to respond with saying, well, then I can't trust God. But don't confuse people with God. People are sinners. People fall short. People fail. But God never 
does. So be mindful of that. Place your trust in God. Because even though people are unfaithful, God is not faith, unfaithful. Well, as Paul goes on in verse 5, he says, But some might say, Our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? So Paul is presenting the other side of the argument and then addressing it. And here he's saying, you know, some people are going to say, well, because I'm a sinner, it shows how good God is. So isn't my sinfulness a good thing? And Paul's going, no, of course not. And then going on, of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? I mean, this is that kind of thinking that goes, well, if I'm more dishonest, then it just shows how wonderful and honest God is. Would any of us legitimately argue that that is reasonable? That that makes any sort of sense? You know, I'm going to glorify God by being the biggest sinner I can be? Um, that's just totally backwards. I'm not saying that we wouldn't rationalize our sin that way, but the reality is... And that's what we have to deal with, reality, not what we'd like it to be, what it is. Reality is our sin doesn't glorify God. Our obedience glorifies God. So Paul's response to that question, verse 8, And some people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin, the better it is. So Paul's going, look, some people even slander us. They accuse us of claiming that. It's ridiculous. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. Now, is he talking about those that say such things as the more we sin, the better it is? Well, those people deserve to be condemned, yes. But I think he's talking about those that slander them by making that accusation that that's what Paul is proclaiming. It's um, It would have been the Jewish community claiming, you know, his, his allegiance to grace and his um, trying to say our salvation isn't dependent on the law. Well, that's just saying that the more we sin, the better it is. And Paul's not having any of it. He's setting the record straight here. He wants people to understand we are saved by grace, not by law, but that is not license to sin. That does not make our sin a good thing. Because, as he's going to cover in a little bit, there is a price for our sin. Now, picking up in verse 9, he says, Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scripture says, and here he, he's using a tradition, the, the Jewish rabbis referred to it as stringing pearls. It's, it's taking nuggets of Old Testament passages. Most of these are out of Psalm, one of them is out of Isaiah, and stringing them together in a way that makes a point and pulls together the truth of scripture as it relates to a particular topic. So he says, as scripture says, and then we kind of roll on with 10 and following. He says, no one is righteous, not even one. Not one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench of an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Now, just kind of interesting side note there, um, when it starts by saying their talk is foul. What Paul is doing with all this, he's actually breaking down the different parts of your anatomy that you use for speaking because there it's not their talk. The literal translation is their throats. 
So we've got a reference to their throats are foul like the stench of an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Uh, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. So he's just kind of building this, this image around these scripture quotes. So there's sin that is what we say. But then there's also the sin of what we do. And that's where he goes next. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Now, what sort of an image do verses 10 through 18 paint? They paint the image of a sinful fallen, condemned creation. Humanity stands condemned before God on their own already. I refer you back to chapter one of Romans. Uh, he made it pretty clear there. So that's the argument he's still carrying forward and going, look, that applies to all of humanity. You want to talk about the Jews? Fine. But aren't the Jews part of humanity? You want to talk about the Gentiles? Fine. Aren't the Gentiles part of humanity? And we've already established all of humanity is guilty before God. We are all sinners earning our punishment. And if God is just and righteous and faithful, then, then he has to be just in judging us for our sin that we are admittedly guilty of. We did it. We earned it. Now, why is Paul laying all that out again? To make the point abundantly clear to those that are arguing that because they're from a Jewish background or they observe the Jewish laws, it puts them in some special standing with God that they're not going to be judged like the Gentiles. And Paul's just reminding them, hey, we're all in the same boat here. So is there a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles? Sure, he's already pointed it out. The Jews had the law. They had that revelation of God. The Gentiles didn't have it. And yet we all wound up in the same place, condemned by our own actions, condemned. In 19, Paul says, obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. Now, as we go through the book of Romans, there's a statement you're going to hear me make over and over again. And I, I think this is probably one of the first times you're going to hear me make it as in this study. And that is, the law was given to show us the righteousness of God and make us aware of our need for a Savior. In other words, to show us that we fall short of the righteousness of God. If we want to try to be right with God based on the standard of the Old Testament law, we will fail. Always, all the time. We will never measure up. Because what the Old Testament law shows us is what the righteousness of God looks like. And we're not him. And we're not that righteous. We are a sinful, broken, fallen people. That's humanity's lot. And we chose it. In fact, we've all embraced it. But that's not the end of the story. Because our becoming aware of our sinfulness, of our need to be made right with God, our failure to measure up to his standard of righteousness brings us to the point of understanding we need a savior. We need someone that can step in and pay the price for us because we can't do it. And that is a discussion that Paul is starting here that will carry throughout the book. Well, let's get back into it. Let me cover 19 again. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. Who was the law given to? Well, the Jews. Um, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. 
again, entire world, Jews and Gentiles. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's it. That's why we have the law. That's what the law does. It shows us our sinfulness. Now, if we stopped there, that would be pretty hopeless, wouldn't it? Oh, great. We have God's word. It tells us how awful we are. Yay. But that's not it. There's so much more. That's just the beginning. That's telling us, hey, there's something there. It points somewhere. And Paul's going to be unpacking that. Verse 21, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So he's already established we're all guilty before God. The law just makes that abundantly clear. So yes, the Jews were given the law, but the law just makes it abundantly clear that we're not right before God. What makes us right with God? We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. It's verse 22. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are are who is beyond being made right with God no one who will place their faith in Jesus Christ he goes on for everyone has sinned we all fall short of God's glorious standard yet God with undeserved kindness declares that we are righteous he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be made right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Now, that took us all the way through 26. But understand what Paul is saying there. He's saying all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us stand guilty before God. Jew, Jew. Gentile, doesn't matter. Guilty. But God shows undeserved kindness. Unmerited favor is one of the translations described. That is, God gives us his love and his grace. And what he does for us is in the person of Christ Jesus. God in the flesh. God himself became that atoning sacrifice that redeems us from our sin. You see, we couldn't do anything to pay for our sin except take the penalty. Death, eternal separation from God, hell. But God's unmerited favor, his undeserved kindness that declares that we are righteous. How does it declare we're righteous? Because our sins all are paid for. But it's not just about us. He mentions here how God held off. He talks about uh, not penalizing those in times past. See, it says 
there in the text in verse 25, this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and included them in what he would do in the present time. What's that mean? It means that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is an adequate atonement for all sin. The sins that had happened in the world prior to that point The people that maybe didn't know his name would be Jesus and he'd be born in, you know, Jerusalem in, you know, the reign of, you know, so on. And they may not have known the specifics. They may not have known his dad would be Joseph and he'd be raised as a carpenter and he would. In fact, they didn't know so much of that. But they knew that God had promised that he would provide a perfect sacrifice for their sin. When they studied the law, it's evident in there. Now, they may have lost sight of it, but it was evident in there that those yearly sacrifices in the temple on the Day of Atonement, the sacrifices in the Holy of Holies at the Ark, that one day a year to mark the sins of the people and cover them. That was a temporary thing. It was never adequate to pay for the sins of the people. It existed to point people towards that promise of God that sin would be paid for and that God would provide a sacrifice. Perfect, complete for paying for that sin. So God did not, he was fair when he didn't hold their sins against them because if they placed their faith in that sacrifice, God promised God's going to take care of it. And I trust him to, they didn't have to know his name. They had to know that God was their savior. Then we get to the present time. Paul's talking about, we know who Jesus is. We've seen it. We've experienced this. You know, many of them that were still alive at that point remembered. Uh, We're talking about the church at Rome. Some of the Jews that made up the church at Rome, the Jewish believers, again, they were at Pentecost. They were in the city. Some of them may remember those events. Christ died for the sins of the world. The ones before, then, all the way through right now. All of us are guilty before God, but all of us are recipients of his undeserved kindness, his grace that atones for our sin if we will turn to him. We have to follow him. We have to accept that grace. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. I got to ask the question, do you believe in Jesus? It makes all the difference. And I don't mean believe that there was a Jesus but do you place your faith and trust? Do you center your world around the reality that Jesus, God in the flesh, came, dwelt among us, died as an atoning sacrifice for your sins so that God's righteousness is satisfied and his grace and love is shown? Not only did he die for our sins, he rose again on the third day and has ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father. And he's coming again. Do you believe in Jesus? Now Paul really emphasizes that it is by faith alone that we are saved. We see this starting in verse 27. He says, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? 
Now, based on everything we've covered, is there anything we say, well, I did this so I'm right with God. I've, I've done enough good stuff that I've even the balance sheet. I'm right with God. You know, can we say that? His response right there in the middle of 27? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. In other words, the only thing we do is we place our faith in Christ. We believe in him. That's it. God did everything. But we can't obey the law and be made right with God. We will always fall short. So again, verse 27, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? See, they had the law. Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Well, of course he is. There is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith. Whether they're Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. You see, he's participating in that diatribe discussion again here a little more. What he's saying is, number one, Jews, you have the law. What does the law do? The law tells us about God. Okay. One of the things the law did, one of the things that made the Jews distinct among all other cultures, they were radically monotheistic. They understood there is only really one God. And not all the other gods are one God. No, there's one true living God. Everything else is made up. Everything else is the manufacture of people who looked at creation and started worshiping some aspect of creation instead of worshiping the creator. They knew that. And so we saying, after all, God's the God of only the Jews? No. He's the God of everybody because there's only one true God, right? So he's the God over everybody. He's the God of the Gentiles too then. And since there's only one God, you know, there is only one God, and he makes people right with himself only by faith, then it doesn't matter. Then only by faith, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. Salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone. It's not a Jewish thing. It's not a Gentile thing. It's a fallen humanity thing and a loving God thing. It is through God's grace. It is through faith in him that we're made right with God. And then this, this diatribe argument here that some people are going to respond this. Well, then, if we emphasize faith, does that mean that we can forget about the law? In other words, oh, it's all about faith. It doesn't matter what I do. I don't have to worry about what God says in the Old Testament law. I don't have to worry about any of that because that's not what it's about. Paul's response to that is emphatic. It's, it's got an exclamation point at the end of it. It's like, of course not. Like, that'd be crazy. If, in fact... Only when we have faith, or in fact, only when we have faith do we fully fulfill the law. You see, if the law shows us God's nature and character is the revelation of God, of himself, to us, if he says, this is what my holiness looks like, then if we've responded in faith to God, if we've placed our faith in Jesus, aren't we going to want to live lives in response to him? that please him? Aren't we wanting to be imitators of our heavenly father? He has shown us what he looks like. So when we respond to Jesus, when we accept Christ, place our faith in him, don't we want to start to look like him? To live like him? 
to behave like him. We can't do that apart from knowing who he is. We can't do that following him and look different than what the Old Testament says. Now, does that mean that all the old rules and all of the the behavioral practices and the cultural practices and everything are still in place? No, it doesn't mean that. Now, there are a few of them that are instituted in the New Testament that, that Jesus emphasizes and things like that. Okay, those are still in place. You know, the, the crazy stuff like don't murder, that's still wrong. But I can have bacon. It may not be the best health option, but I can have bacon and it's not particularly a sin because it comes from a pig. You know, that. how do I know that? Well, because of that vision that, that Peter had on the rooftop where God lowered all the animals and said, take, eat. And he's like, no, I can't do that. And God says, hey, I made it. It's good. And he was saying it's about relationship to God, not ritual. Now, the principles behind a lot of that still apply. But the law is not, well, I can do whatever I want now because I got faith in Jesus. All the old rules don't apply. Well, all the old rules don't apply, but the revelation of God through his word is still the revelation of God through his word. If we're going to live for him, then we want to follow him. We want to look like him. We want to do we want to be imitators of our Heavenly Father. We want to do the stuff that he describes. So we don't get to just chunk the Old Testament. We don't just get to chunk Scripture and say, well, I've got faith. I don't need any of that. No. Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Hmm. Hmm. That's a pretty profound statement that Paul is making both to the Gentiles, the Gentile Christians in the church at Rome, but very much so also making to the Jewish Christians at the church at Rome, saying, hey, you want to follow the law? You can do it when you follow Jesus. Get that right. Because you can try to follow the law, and you won't be following Jesus. But if you follow Jesus, you're going to be able to follow the law in a way that means something. It is the grace of God given to us. It is God with undeserved kindness declaring that we are righteous. Don't forget it. God's grace should never be presumed upon. It is an incredible gift. And it is his gift to us, even though we didn't earn it and we don't deserve it. But because he loves us and God's grace is for everyone. And I pray if you haven't turned to him and accepted his grace through believing in Jesus Christ, I pray that you will do that. That you will accept his grace and experience what it is to be declared righteous by God and to be able to begin to live out the law because you're living out your faith in Christ. Well, I thank you for joining us today. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, for your undeserved kindness to us. That while we were sinners condemned, deserving our fate, you provided a way of salvation. You provided a sacrifice for our sin that saves us. Father, I thank you that you have given us opportunity. Opportunity to turn to Christ, to know Jesus, to place our faith in him, and to be made right with you. Father, thank you for that awesome gift and that it's not dependent on how good we are, but God is dependent on how good you are, how faithful you are. Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Help us to live 
this week in such a way that we glorify you. Help us to live out your law on our hearts. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.